Well, I am very pleased to introduce this morning, uh, Johan and Yogi Terrell. Um, we all know, I think, uh, Johanan through uh, his marketing firm, Warhol and Wall Street, but uh, he, he does so much more. I don't know if I have time this morning to list it all here. He's also the founder and director of the Columbus Fashion Alliance, which seeks to empower Columbus in being a world-renowned fashion capital and the number one place in which brands and creatives come to start and grow their fashion-based businesses. I already think we're, we're up there, but that's as much a part uh, of the, the role that Johanna has played. He serves on many, many boards in Columbus, including the GCAC Board of Trustees, the Short North Alliance Board of Directors, Nationwide Children's Hospital Development Board, the Create, the Create Columbus Commission, and he's also a co-founding member of Black Hack, a platform focused on educating minority entrepreneurs in technology, entertainment, and trends. Speaking this morning on the theme folklore, please join me this morning in welcoming Johanan Yogi Terrell. All right. And you're hearing <clears throat> rapturous applause, uh, Zoom applause there, Johanan. <laughs> well, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Thank you guys for inviting me to hang out with you guys this morning. Uh, I'm not a morning person as well, so uh, bear with me. And uh, I got my tea here. I'll try to uh, hopefully uh, have some engaging conversation. You know, I'm definitely more of a conversation type of person, so uh, I'll try my best to keep the flow going. But I definitely look forward to having a conversation around this. Um, as he mentioned, the, the topic is folklore. And so um, when I first heard about the topic, it uh, I was very curious about, you know, um, just the just what is folklore and just understanding of really, you know, folklore through history and and all of that. So um, my I guess my chat this morning really is about just me diving into, you know, what folklore is about and hopefully uh, have a little fruitful conversation with everyone about it, because I think it's pretty interesting. And um, when you think of folklore, you think, you know, old tales and fairy tales and folk tales and things like that. But uh, folklore is um, very much alive and well today. So, um, so yeah, let's do it. Let's dive into it. Uh, I wanted to start this off with uh, telling you a story. I want to tell you guys, share, uh, share a story with you guys um, that I, that I think, well, it's, I always laugh at it when I tell this story, but um, it kind of it, it may or may not even really tie into this, but I'm going to tell it anyway. All right. So. Um, so the story goes. So uh, I don't know if anybody's ever had the Carlos pizza. It's it's uh, it's in Columbus, Ohio now. Right. So anybody know about the Carlos? All right. So the Carlos pizza, I think it originally started in Wheeling, West Virginia or in West Virginia, all I know is that my dad was from Wheeling, West Virginia, right? And so he would always, uh, when we would go to visit my family in Wheeling, he would always stop by the Carlos Pizza. And so the Carlos Pizza is, it's, <laughs> it's different because the way they cook the pizza, it's like they they bake the, the dough and the sauce. And then, you know, when it comes out really hot, they put the cheese and the pepperoni on after, after they, they bring it out. So it just has this really like crispy crust, but the cheese and the pepperoni is like freshly melted. So, um, so it's really good. It's just, it's just, they make it different. So it was always a treat for me and my dad, like when we would go to, to Wheeling to go to DiCarlo's pizza and, uh, and, and get the pizza. So, you know, um, it was one of those, you know, days where my dad was like, we're going to go to Wheeling. I see Ray George, he's from Wheeling. Okay. So Ray knows about DiCarlo's. Um, so we go to DiCarlo's and uh my dad I'm, and we were poor too so like growing up we didn't have a lot of have a lot of money so my dad we would wait to eat until we got to wheeling so we could go to the carlos and eat this pizza so we get into carlos right and uh we're all super excited but that's like you ready and i'm like yeah let's go so we go into carlos we order like six slices of the carlos pizza because they give it to you like two four six eight you can get it in different sizes so we get a the carlos pizza and it comes out fresh and hot my dad looks at me he he goes you know, go over there to the station and put some, you know, uh, some hot peppers on it and some, you know, Parmesan cheese and, and oregano and stuff. So, you know, most pizza shops, they had that little area where the napkins are and, and, uh, and, you know, the shakers and whatnot. So, you know, he gives me this task and I grab the box and I'm like, all right, now I had to be about, 
let me see, I was about probably like 10 around this time. So, you know, I was still pretty young, but, you know, uh, I, I took the mission and I'm like, all right, my dad wants me to go hook up this pizza. So I go over to the little station, open up the pizza box and, you know, they have those, uh, the little glass jars, you know, they had little twirls in them and it has either, you know, Parmesan cheese or, you know, um, the hot pepper flakes and stuff like that on it. So I'm feeling real good about it. I'm like, man, we're about to smash this pizza and we're, we're shaking it. I'm shaking the hot peppers on it, put a little oregano on it. And then I start pouring this Parmesan cheese on it. And so I'm like, man, I want to really, I like Parmesan cheese. So I'm just pouring and pouring and pouring and pouring. And in my mind, I'm like, this Parmesan cheese, this pizza is so hot. This Parmesan cheese is like melting as I'm shaking it on. It's like melting and melting, melting. So I'm just piling it on. I pile it on. I'm like, all right, I think that's good. <laughs> I close the box. I get in the car. <laughs> and we didn't even like, we're in the park a lot. And I get, I get, uh, I get in the car. My dad and my dad get in the car. And he's like, all right, hand me that box. And this is like that moment, right? And we like open up the box. He was like, oh man, you ready? And I'm like, I'm ready, dad. Like, let's smash this pizza. Like, this is my favorite pizza. And my dad grabs a slice and I grab a slice. And my dad, <laughs> and my dad like takes a bite of this pizza. <laughs> and as he's taking the bite, he's like, oh God. <laughs> like, <laughs> he's like spinning oh, no. out of the door and, he, and, and I remember I remember the look my dad gave me he looked at me like <laughs> he gave me this look like I never see this look ever in my life from my dad but he gave me this look and like it wasn't hate but it was like what did you do to this pizza bro and I'm just like <laughs> I don't know but I guess what I did was instead of the shaker having Parmesan cheese in it, it was salt. <laughs> so, so this whole time I'm, I'm thinking that the Parmesan cheese was melting fast on the pizza because it kept disappearing. <laughs> it was salt. It was salt. So, and, and so, so when he took that first bite, it was just like he just took a mouthful of like salt. And so, and so, since we didn't have a lot of money, you just you could tell the disappointment in space because we both were like super hungry. We like both were like super hungry. And he just looked at me like you ruined it. I, was, I felt I felt so bad. I felt so bad because. I knew he didn't have enough money to get any more pizza. And he tried for like five minutes, five minutes. He was trying to dust off, dust off the slices. He was trying to dust off the slices like, and he would try to bite it. And he was like, ah, and he just closed the box and he threw it away. And he didn't speak to me. He didn't speak to me for like, uh, man, he didn't speak to me for like a good, I would say a good hour or so. He just, he was just quiet and I never felt so bad. I was like, my dad was disappointed. And I always like, my dad was like my idol. So I was always like, you know, uh, looked up to him. So I felt really bad because I had just ruined dinner, you know, and I, I took it on, taking on this, this challenge. But every time I tell that story, I like, I feel like, ah, oh, man, I like laugh myself in the tears because it's just so funny. And just the way. The way his face looked, I wish I could show a picture of that. I wish I'd have took a picture that time, but uh, he was so disappointed. And so, you know, um, <laughs> so basically, there's a lesson in that, right? And and uh, I was I was going to ask you guys, really, like, what do you think the lesson for for me was in that moment? Anybody? Anybody? There's a lesson in there somewhere, right? I'll say like, uh, here's one, um, like looks can be deceiving, you know what I mean? Or don't, judge, I guess don't judge a book by its cover or things aren't always as they appear, you know what I mean? And so if I'd have, took, if I'd have taken just a couple of seconds just to, to look at, you know, what was in this shaker, maybe I'd have realized earlier that it was, oh uh, yeah, with, with great power comes with great responsibility. Yeah. <laughs> There you go. Right. Things like that. And maybe if I would have looked at this closer, I would have saw that. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, you know, there was a lesson to be learned in that. And and uh, I always go back to that story because I always think about paying attention to detail now. 
right? Because if you don't pay attention to detail, man, you can ruin a good moment, you know, or, you know, you can just do whatever. But um, the point is, is that no matter what the story is, like, that's a favorite story for me. Um, it is, it is the lessons that, that we learn through experiences like that. Right. And so I tell that story because it has helped me think about paying attention to detail. And so that is really at the essence of like what folklore is. It doesn't matter the story or how you tell the story, but at the end of the day, it's a lesson in that story for you. Right. And that lesson usually gets carried on throughout your life. So that's kind of what we're going to talk about today is really the essence of folklore, what it means, and really why it's still such a big part of our lives. Um, but uh, thank you for uh, letting me tell that story, man, because it's, uh, <laughs> it's, this is a great story. You know? I'm always looking for an audience to tell that story to. Okay. All right. So let's dive into folklore. Um, so we'll start by just a basic definition of folklore, right? So by uh, definition, the noun folklore is really the traditional beliefs, customs, and stories of a community kind of passed through generations by word of mouth, right? Um, or it's a body of popular myth and beliefs relating to a particular place, activity, or group of people. So there's, you know, things like Hollywood folklore or you know, uh, here's an example of like carpenter's folklore, you know, measure twice, cut once, right? Um, there's a folklore that we're, that we've all become familiar with, like Cinderella, whose actual name was Cinderella. Uh, and the cinder comes from the fact that she always had to sweep the chimney. I didn't know that. So I found that out through, uh, through doing my research, but like things like Cinderella, Rapunzel, uh, Pinocchio, you know, and Pinocchio, the lesson is, you know, don't lie, right? Um, but at the end of the day, um, you know, there's that that group type of folklore based upon like a certain group or place or activity yeah. or just the beliefs and customs. Right. So let's break it down a little bit more. Let's talk about the name. Right. So folklore comes from folk, the word folk and the word lore. Right. So folk basically meaning people at the end of the day, it's about the people. And then lore is really that body of traditions and knowledge on a subject held by a particular group, right? So if you think about it like that, folklore and folk tales are pretty much like, uh, they sugarcoat the lessons of life, you know, a hard life in order to kind of give the audience pointers on how they should behave or live, right? It's one of the best mediums to pass on living culture or traditions to future generations. And so when you think about that through history, right? we all kind of need guidance. You know, nobody grows up in, a, in, in an environment where they get all the lessons of life. And some of us, you know, we may not have, you know, parents or mentors or guardians that kind of give us these lessons in life. And then I think as we even grow up uh, and become adults ourselves, we realize that our parents never really had a clue either, right? Because we don't have a clue. So I think, you know, folklore has really paid a, a played a part in all of our lives as this kind of way of guiding ourselves, right? And, and giving us, um, those uh, helpful tips on how to kind of get through life and what things to look out for. So when you think about that, um, especially even for me, for myself, like, you know, um, growing up in, uh, in Akron, growing up the way I grew up, you know, not having my dad around as much. And then even when he was around, I was too busy destroying pizza. But, uh, <laughs> but um, you know, you know, you, 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 look around and you see around you and you see what's going on and you hear things and you kind of soak up all of this information and then you process that information and that innate desire as humans that we have to kind of figure out and move throughout life and uh, leaning on each other. Folklore story kind of helps us with that. It gives us a bit of that guidance. It helps us hope. It helps us escape through the stories, but we always are able to kind of walk away with this kind of lesson that we can use. And uh, we'll talk about a little bit of that too later on. Um, Let's break down some of the, the elements of folklore kind of across history and culture. There's typically four types of folklore. I mean, some say more or less, but I'm going to just stick to these four. There's uh, oral literature, there's material culture, there's the social folk, and there's performing folk arts. Um, you know, and what is, it, what is it about that folklore that we, that we love, right? And when you think about throughout the history, back in the day, you know, um, you know, people would gather, you know, alongside, the, you know, a fire to hear 
the the village elder speak or the chief or you know um someone would you know through horse and carriage would come into a town and set up you know uh, uh their carriage and and put on a show and tell stories and you know and then you know go on to the next uh village or whatnot but what makes us you know uh be drawn to and 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 excited to to hear these stories and these lessons of life and and be able to you know take those and pass them on to the the next uh, generation right and uh, I think one of the things that we do love about it is that you know when it pays off in in, in real life right so like that gratification of when folklore pays off in your life is what keeps it going right I mean how many times have you told somebody Hey, you know, uh, whatever it was, you know, um, you know, hey, man, remember, looks can be deceiving. And it's always kind of on point in that moment of the conversation. Right. Uh, or when you see it happen and you're like, yo, I got to tell you the story, you know, looks can be deceiving. Right. So this is what happened. And it, and it paid off in some type of way. And uh, I think that is really what um, that gratification is really um, what pays off in life when you when you see that these these lessons actually are you know they have value to them and they actually help you at certain moments in your life um i'll even break it down i'll give you guys an example of uh, a traditional kind of like folklore uh tale and and one that we're all familiar with but um we'll talk about uh that but let me break down the kind of what do you need right what are those different elements you need um for folklore to have you know to to, to be effective uh one you need a storyteller Right. So you need a storyteller and, you know, um, you need an audience, you need a narrative, you need a message or a lesson, and then you need a platform. Right. So those are kind of the essential elements that you need in order for folklore to, to live on. Um, and then even to go back to the storyteller part, you know, there is a responsibility of, of being that storyteller. Right. There is that responsibility of that village elder or that shaman or that chief or that jester or that, you know, um, that you know, storyteller uh, out of village to make sure that they are, you know, telling the right, you know, the right story the right way, making sure that they're, you know, expressing the the lesson of it, and that people are able to kind of take that lesson and move on. So there is a responsibility of a storyteller, uh, usually as somebody that's highly respected or regarded uh, in a community, and there is a responsibility of that as they pass it down from generation to generation. So knowing those basic elements of uh, folklore. Um, let's talk about uh, another example, right? So I kind of gave my example, my story about my dad, but um, we'll go back to what, it's like mid-century. So, you know, how many of us know about like the Pied Piper, right? So everybody know about the Pied Piper? Right, so Pied Piper, um, it originated from, let me see, Hamlin, Germany during the Middle Ages. And uh, as the story goes, you know, and this actually ties into a real story. What I've what I've uh, discovered is that there really was a, a, a rat pop problem in, in Hamlin, Germany uh, during the mid century. And so this story is kind of birthed out of that. But as the story goes, you know, there was a town struggling with a rat infestation and they were really, you know, desperate for relief and comes along this uh, Pied Piper and pied meant like the uh, basically like the outfit that they wore um, was like colorful and they wore these kind of colors, almost like a uniform. So this Pied Piper, you know, comes in and he's like, you know, I can get rid of the rats for you. And so the Pied Piper comes in and he does his thing and he gets the rats out of town. But then, you know, uh, the people of the town of Hamlin um, didn't pay him as they had promised. Right. And so he's like, OK, well, if you're not going to pay me my money. Uh, I'll. I'll figure out something. I'll be back. And next thing you know, he comes back and he leads all of the children away from the town as well. And so the town loses all the children. And, uh, you know, what is the lesson in that? You know, I mean, the lesson is you got to pay the man. You know what I mean? <laughs> you got to pay you got to pay your bills, baby. I mean, it, you know, somebody does a job for you. You got to pay them um, or, you know, it might turn on you at some point. So that is a, a kind of a traditional story that dates all the way back to uh, the mid century. And then um, a little side note on that, uh, R. Kelly used to call himself the Pied Piper of R&B, <laughs> which, which if, you, if you just think about that for a little bit, it's kind of funny. It's like, who calls himself that? And then doesn't think that at some point, you know, life is going to catch up with you. <laughs> There's a lesson in that one too, huh? Um, don't call yourself the Pied Piper of R&B. 
I wonder if that came up in court too. I wonder if I wonder if like the judge at some point said, "Hey, you know, call yourself the Pied Piper of R and B." Like, what is that about? <laughs> but anyway, um, changes in content, but the lessons are still the same, right? So now let's talk about folklore, uh, kind of like now and in the future, right? So um, folklore has always been popular, but um, it didn't really see a, a strong growth or increase until really um the latest you know couple of centuries right around you know the 1900s and and even more now it's probably uh thriving as strong as as ever these days but it wasn't as popular um as before and i think that was just because of the platform so like i said you know you need a storyteller audience a narrative a message and a lesson um but then you also need a, a platform so i think nowadays you know, when we talk about folklore now, um, it has become more and more um, popular and more and more present is because we have uh, stronger platforms to tell these stories on where before you had to wait until, you know, uh, it was story time by the fire. Or if you got a hold of a book, you know, you got to kind of read some of these things where now we have television and radio and now social media. And so it's really blown up over the past uh, generation. And we have more you know, more platforms that can reach more people. We have global connectivity and that kind of has changed the game. And so um, now, you know, it has taken a different shape. It's not so much uh, the fairy tales of old, right? Um, what we, you know, traditionally think about folklore, we think about those Rapunzel's and Pinocchio's and the Grimm brothers and things like that. But now it's really the quotes, the memes, the imagery, right? It's the impact. It's really the things that we talk about the way that we talk about things today, right? And that's what's interesting about it is um, when you start to look at today, how we communicate, right? And again, this is about the people. So, you know, folklore isn't exactly like I said, it's not what you read in books. It's really what are we talking about as people now, right? And how are we sharing messages with each other now? So when you think about that, um, there's probably more lessons and stories and tales uh, told, I mean, by the second these days. So folklore is like really, really thriving. And when I think about um, like memes, uh, I, I watched a whole um, TED talk on how memes are really today's folklore and how images and social media, um, you know, if we think about even the last couple of years, um, what are some of the things that we see prevalent in, in a way that we communicate, right? There will, you know, there's like the moments of 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 wokeness. There is the 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 language of the 80s that and the, the 90s that really you know stood out. Um, there was the introduction of new platforms and then you know those pioneers on those platforms, you know, when you look at the first time like vines started to come out and people started creating content on vines. Um, and now, you know, there's reels and TikTok and things like that, but uh, we cannot wait to take hours to upload a, a video um, just to prove a point or to tell a story these days. So now you have this abundance of folklore that is our version of our folklore that we kind of spread today, um, you know, all over the world. So really it has taken a, a different shape as we know it. Um, and then we think about you know, going into the future, you know, um, the younger generations, right? Uh, and we were the younger generation at some point. And I, I know I grew up in the hip hop generation. So for me and, you know, my mom or my parents or my elders, it was a definite like break in between, you know, how we communicated with each other. And um, so we think about even our younger generations, millennials, Gen Z's, things like that. Um, there's this, you know, kind of unraveling of that traditional sense, right? There's this, uh, instead of the fire now, it's, you know, we're gathering around apps, right? And so when you think about the audiences, this, um, there's so many different audiences now, right? So, I mean, if you look at Facebook groups, you look at Twitter groups, you look at, there's so many ways for you to kind of get tapped into a group that shares the same values and beliefs as you, right? And within those, you know, subgroups, you're able to kind of share knowledge with each other and share this folklore with each other. And so it's almost nowadays you're able to really tap into a very niche group and audience to share those uh, stories with you. Um, and there's sides to that too, right? So like 
Social media definitely helps us share those stories and customs, but there's also the other side, right? With misinformation and these algorithms, even pushing like negative storylines that are impacting really our culture. And uh, we're gonna tap on that uh, a little bit later, but social media definitely is shifting in uh, the way that we think about um, folklore and the way that we share folklore. And it's also gotten to the point where it's starting to manipulate uh, movement and people through through folklore. And I didn't really realize that until we started kind of diving deep into this is that, you know, um, when from a traditional sense folklore, it was one audience, one speaker, you know, telling a story. And there was two sides of that too. So like Bruce has said, the Irish potato famine, things like that. There was, there was always a dark side of folklore. Um, there's, so there's different sides of it. But, you know, what we're seeing now is how social media um, which I just find, I find hugely interesting because I remember I, I worked for Radio One and I think Tim's on here too. What's up, Tim? Um, and I worked for Radio One and I remember um, when we were working for Radio One, I was a social media kind of content editor and I used to create content all the time. And I remember pushing out this content, you know, social media was like, it was for you to use at your own will, right? It was like, I could post my pictures, my friends see them and I could post a story and all of my friends see it. And uh, I remember it shifted one year. It was like just in one year, Facebook said, you know what? I'm cutting all that off. And it just throttled everybody's, you know, engagement. And then all of a sudden it, uh, it became, instead of you using social media, social media now uses you. So social media, um, you know, we would have the managers from Facebook call us and say, hey, if you really want to get views, you got to do video. Or if you really want to get engagement, you got to go live. And now it's like, if you really want to get your word out there, you got to create reels and stories. And so we've seen this kind of, you know, weird shift where social media has become more about social manipulation and it uses things like folklore to change behaviors. And I think this is where, you know, it's getting really interesting on how we have to, you know, we talk about that responsibility of folklore. We have to, as, as humans, we have to make sure that we are protecting those lessons that we're protecting the way that folklore is spread because it can have very uh, negative impacts if not if not um, protected if not done right and so we've seen that right um, and we think about uh, that 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 dark side of folklore as it seems today you know you look at like what happened with PizzaGate right uh, you look at things like QAnon and things like that where there's these you know niche groups that get together and they share information, but then you have, you know, the algorithms that kind of keep feeding that negative storyline that negative propaganda. Um, and, 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 and we saw that, uh, I guess you look at it like uh, Nazi Germany back in the day, you know, the propaganda that they had, you know, to, to create this picture and this image um, in a way that was folklore, but it was just definitely used in the wrong way, but to paint this picture of, of, uh, of Jews and, 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 and other, you know, nationalities and, and kind of create this, you know, image of what, you know, Hitler thought was the perfect, you know, human or the perfect Aryan and things like that. Um, but you have that happening now with, you know, social media where it's, you know, things like Pizzagate and somebody's walking into a pizza shop and, and uh, going crazy because they, you know, think that there's Hollywood people hiding, you know, children in the basement of a, of a pizza shop, you know? So there's this, um, there's this weird time where folklore is being challenged uh, by algorithms and by um, artificial intelligence. And I think that um, as the keepers of the story, right, as each generation moves on, we have to protect that. And I think really that's what this, uh, this, this journey for me kind of took me on was that um, folklore is definitely something that we have used and we continue to use to help us kind of get through life. We love to share, you know, lessons in life with our friends, family, our children, and all of that. But um, as we start to increase the way that we engage each other and create more opportunities to uh, tell our stories, whether it's virtual reality, augmented reality, social media, and whatever that future platform is, what we have to make sure uh, that we do is that we're responsible for uh, how we tell the story, um, that we own a responsibility of the storyteller, and that we uh, protect ourselves from um, from manipulation through 
you know, things like uh, artificial intelligence and social media to where um, it could turn folklore almost into a weapon. Um, so um, that is my, I guess that's my, my learning of uh, folklore, my journey on diving into folklore from yesterday and today. And uh, I love to just, you know, join you guys in talking about, you know, folklore period. And that's it. Awesome. Awesome. That's fantastic, Johan, and thank you. <clears throat> well, and we have uh, we have some questions that are that are that are popping up here. And and uh, if, uh, if you have questions uh, that you'd like to raise, please write them in the chat. We'll go ahead and uh, we'll go ahead and curate them. Uh, Eva, you asked a question. I was going to ask a, a similar sort of question. Yours is much better. Uh, how do you weave folklore into the Columbus Fashion Alliance? Um, you know, I think it's pretty well, it's pretty easy for me because, you know, Columbus is the third largest uh, fashion city in the country. And a lot of people don't know that. So really, the fact that uh, I am telling that story alone uh, was that's not even folklore. That's fact. But um, what I guess what I'm trying to show people is that. Um, you can use fashion in order to kind of create opportunities for people here in Columbus, Ohio. And so um, when you have when you have a gift like we do in Columbus, such as the wealth of knowledge and the expertise from around the world that works, lives, plays here um, in the fashion industry, um, when you have such a gift, you have to use your gifts. Right. And that's one of the things that we all learn. That's like from, you know, passed down from generation to generation, you know, uh, tap into, you know, your gifts and and hone those gifts and use that and, and share, right? Share your gifts with the world. And I think that's what, um, you know, Columbus has not really done over the, the past, you know, four decades that we've built this whole monopoly in the fashion industry. It's kind of often been in silos. And so our job now is to take that information and that knowledge of the fashion industry and bring it down to the community and weave it into the fabric of our city, no pun intended, but to really bring that, that knowledge base into our community, because it, um, it could create so much opportunity for people. Um, we just did a documentary with, um, through a program we did last summer with 15 young high school students. And our question is, you know, what can happen when you teach these young individuals, you know, all about the industry that they already influenced and that they, you know, um, are consumers of and highly sought after consumers. What if you could teach them everything that happens before it even hits the rack? And you couldn't do that in many other cities, but you can do that here in Columbus. So that is really how folklore uh, ties into that. You know, um, when you have a gift shared, it could create more opportunity for people. Uh, Donna, a few minutes ago, about 10 minutes ago, you put something here in the chat that said, we have all of those elements, but without the lessons. Donna, were you talking specifically like about memes and social media, that sort of things? I thought this was a really profound observation. Hmm. You still there, Donna? Maybe Donna. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm uh, in my car. <laughs> no, no, no. I understand. <laughs> well, I, I, um, I, yeah, I was, I, I was thinking about, um, you know, like the the structure because I'm a writer and I understand like story structure and sometimes in meme culture in this like fast storytelling culture the it doesn't seem like that lesson is being built up you know um, there's punchline there's the immediacy but you know what lessons are really being passed on from a a, a generational perspective um, that's I sometimes lose that in a lot of uh, social media um, quick lessons that are quick, um, you know, storytelling that I'm seeing nowadays. Yeah, I, I would agree. And, um, you know, I guess the thing that I learned from this is that, you know, folklore really is whatever the people make. it. So it, it may change, you know, um, it may change in, in how it's done and, and the structure that we that we assume it should take. But it's really at the end of the day, it's for the, it's the it's the common people's way of sharing information. So when I think about that, I look at like, 
you know, those videos that people share all the time, like instant karma videos, you see them all the time on like, um, on ridiculousness and on, you know, certain, you know, TV shows, but like, those are six second lessons in life about instant karma, right? <laughs> like, don't be an asshole or look where you're going, you know, <laughs> things like that. So like, there's ways that we're still sharing these, but they're much more visual nowadays, right? They're not as, you know, it might need, might not be as much speaking uh, per se, um, but even in that quick, you know, that quick six second video, there's something to walk away from that. You can see that and be like, man, you got to look where you're going, bro. And, <laughs> and, that, and that is, that is, and, and therefore uh, the less. Well, so Johan and I was going to ask a, a, a slightly, I guess, perpendicular question to this. So, you know, we were talking about, well, you said that folklore is thriving and you were talking specifically about, you know, meme culture, for instance, and social media. Uh, do you think, do you think we're overstoried? Do you think there are too many stories today? That's, that's a good question. Um, you know what? I think, mm, I don't think so because I think stories um, are much more like, again, they're, they're just, there's audiences for each story right now. I mean, there's a lot of stories, there's a lot of input, but then also at the same time, we have a shorter attention span. So I feel like you almost, you almost need more and more content because you forgot about the last one like 20 seconds ago. So, um, you know, I think uh, we are short of rich stories, right? We're short of, of, of that. And I mean, there's obviously there's books and things like that, but I mean, when it comes to folklore, where we're seeing less and less of that, you know, uh, let me tell you about this and more and more of meme culture, right? So it's kind of changed from, you know, you and your friends in the circle kind of sharing life lessons as you explore the world now to you're exploring the world virtually with each other. And, you know, the lesson you share with somebody is a meme you posted to them that you sent in their direct messages. So I think, um, I think we are being inundated with a bunch, you know, with a bunch more shorter, you know, shorter form content. Um, but I don't know if we're overstoried per se. We probably could use some. Uh, Donna had also written a question. Well, she, I'll just, I'll just read what she wrote here. The responsibility of the storyteller is very important. Can you talk about responsibility in telling stories in marketing? Yeah. Um, I think obviously with marketing, there's a much more responsibility in telling the story, right. And, um, and uh, I think, you know, marketing definitely, marketing has changed too in a way, right? And I think you have to be a little bit more authentic in marketing nowadays. Um, you know, back in the day, um, and there's still, there's still, you know, when you look at marketing and branding, you still have the, the kind of fantastic, you know, commercials and all of that. But um, I think because of, we live in a much more social driven world that um, marketing now, you have to be a lot more authentic and a lot more transparent to really you know, get your point across and, and you should, you know, I think, um, I think people kind of see behind the veil, you know, before where you could, you know, uh, you could talk about like, for instance, soda, you know, um, soda was really easy to market back in the day when you didn't know what was in it. And so like back in the day, it was like, it's magical elixir, you know, it tickles your tongue, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's like, true, <laughs> right, right. You're like, yeah, you know, I'm gonna drink this stuff. And now it's like, you know, people know like there's a ton of sugar in that stuff. So like, you know, um, so now in marketing, you have to be, you know, a little bit more authentic and uh, the storyteller, you know, the responsibility of storyteller is very important because I still have to, I still have to, you know, get you to like this product, but I have to do it with, with, with being more authentic and more transparent about the product and still find where the connection is at, you know, whether that's nostalgia or, um, or, um, or, you know, novelty or whatever. But um, I think there still is definitely a, a responsibility of storyteller and marketing, for sure. Uh, I loved your uh, evocation of uh, like village elders and, the, and sort of the place of the storyteller in the community. Um, do we have such storytellers in CBUS? Do we have, uh, do we have village elders? Um, Maybe that's you, sir. Well, yeah, I mean, man, I'm 44 now, so I guess so. I guess, I'm, getting, I'm getting up there, I guess so. But I, I think so. I think there are. I mean, you know, um, 
I think there's always that, you know, either a patriarch or matriarch of the family or uncle or a good friend or just somebody who's wise, who has the wisdom. And that could even be in young people who've experienced a lot. Um, hey, and somebody feels like David is uh, uh, David Staley fits that role as well. So uh, oh, so we all are still the elder part, people. especially. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think, um, you know, I, I think we definitely don't have as many. Well, I guess in that traditional sense of the gathering around, you know, to kind of hear that person speak. But um, we do. I mean, when you think about you got YouTube uh, influencers, right, who get millions of people to tune in every time they go live. That's a modern version of gathering around a fire. Right. It's like I get a notification such and such going live now. Bop, and then I'm, I'm watching something endlessly for like 10 minutes um, and. I don't know if there's going to be a lesson in that or not, but uh, we definitely have gathered around many fires <laughs> through things like social media these days. So um, it may not be that former, but it still happens. I love that. Uh, I love that evocation. <clears throat> and I love uh, talking stories. And uh, I, I think that uh, one of the things we can walk away from is this. This is certainly something that, uh, that, that, that we try to have every month with Creative Mornings. Maybe we need to start Maybe we need to start marketing that. <laughs> this is your <laughs> monthly uh, monthly storytelling uh, a monthly monthly storytelling fix. It is. Uh, it really is. I mean, that's what I thought about it. I mean, Creative Mornings to me is a time for everybody to kind of gather and to talk about something interesting, learn something, you know, and kind of walk away inspired, right? So from the Creative Mornings I've seen and been to, that's what I took away from it. And that's why I think they're great because they are opportunities for people to gather around. And it's not so much about me, it's really about the story. It's about the conversation that we're having. So I think when you ask about, are those platforms happening? It's happening right now, you know? Boy, Hannon, thank you very, very much. This was this was just fantastic. And uh, I, I will never think about pizza the same way again. So <laughs> yeah, well, check, make sure y'all check the shakers, bro. Like check the shakers <laughs> before uh, you uh, sprinkle on your pizza for sure.